This is Mickey, our rescue cat, who has FIV, which means he's not allowed to go outside as it's a disease that can be passed to other cats. Mickey seems to love laying in the sun and we thought it'd be nice for him to get some fresh air, so we want to build an outdoor enclosure for him. We've got this huge patio at the side of our bungalow that we've never really known what to do with. So this is the patio that's going to become the catio. To build the walls, I've got some 4.8 meter and 3.6 meter lengths of two by two. These measure about 45 millimeters square. And the first job is to pull these out and try and find the straightest lengths that I can use to make up the length of my first wall. So I'm just sighting down the length of each one so that I can see how crooked they are. This one is bent like a banana, as you can see. It'll still get used though, I can just chop it up into shorter pieces where the bend won't be so much of an issue. Fortunately I did have a few nice straight ones. I'm going to start by cutting all of my uprights as they all need to be exactly the same length. And I'm going to cut three at a time by clamping one end together with the ends all flush and then using a circular saw and speed square to guide the cut. With the uprights cut, next I'm going to cut a couple of spacer pieces, and I'm cutting these to 530 millimeters. There's a very good reason for that specific spacing, which I'll explain later in the video. I'm going to dip all of my cut ends in some clear preserver treatment, which will prolong the life of the timber, protecting it from wood boring insects and rot. To assemble my walls, I'm actually going to use my paving slabs as a reference for getting them nice and square. I can lay the bottom plate along the line of the slabs and then position the first upright perpendicular to it and again in line with the mortar joint between the slabs so that I know that my corners will be 90 degrees. I put some blocks underneath just to lift it up a bit which will make it easier to drive in the screws to secure everything together and each upright gets two screws in each end to hold it in place. I'm using my spacers at the top and bottom to get a consistent spacing between each and every upright before driving in the screws, and soon enough, my first wall is coming together. When I get to the end, I measure top and bottom to make sure my measurements match, and they were within a couple of millimetres, which will be absolutely fine for this. And once the last upright is in, I can trim off the ends of the top and bottom wall plates. I'm going to be using this galvanized mesh that comes on a roll and as it's 900 millimeters in width I'm going to space the noggins in my wall frame so that they give somewhere to secure both the bottom layer of mesh and the next layer of mesh above it. Well that was my plan anyway but things didn't really work out like that and I'll explain why later. After making the marks along each of the uprights I can reuse my spacers as noggins and I cut a few more at the same length so that I can finish the wall with one in between each upright which is going to help add rigidity to the wall. Most of these screws needed to be toenailed in at an angle. Meanwhile, Mickey was making sure my work meets his approval. On to wall number two, and it's going to be assembled in pretty much the same way, except this wall is going to have a door added to it. With the basis of the wall laid out on the floor, I measure from the inside of the top plate to the outside of the bottom plate and that gives me the height I want my door to be, 2,226 millimeters to be precise, but I'm gonna knock off five millimeters just for some clearance at the top of the door. With my pieces cut, I'm going to secure a central rail in the middle of the door and that will allow me to brace the door with two diagonal braces and for those I can just offer them up, mark and cut the angles. I want these to be a nice tight fit to make sure that the door doesn't sag, so I crept up on the cut lines until it was a nice friction fit like this. And again a bit of preserver, and then I can fix the braces in place with a couple of screws. With the door done I can then do a bit of maths to figure out the best spacing for the uprights on my second wall, allowing for the door plus a few millimetres either side for clearance, and then I can frame it all out. These uprights were spaced 605 millimeters, so a bit wider than the 530 millimeters I used on the first wall, but that really doesn't matter. At this point, I'm going to paint the walls with some leftover dark gray garden paint that I had laying around. This is the same paint I used on the pergola and the garden table and the outdoor sofas and the coffee table, so it'll match everything nicely. Right, so this is where the project took a turn for the worse. I'd never used galvanized mesh before and I really didn't enjoy working with it. I got some of these staples to secure the mesh in place and I didn't enjoy working with those either. Ah, 
I'm not happy with this. These rolls of chicken wire measure 900 millimeters wide, but I feel like the coverage they give is actually closer to a meter. And that's because it has quite a bit of stretch to it across the width of the roll. And I wanted to fit the mesh so that it was nice and tight. But as you can see, I've got a good two, maybe even three inches overhanging. I've checked the information online and there's no mention of the coverage being greater than the width of the roll, which is frustrating. There's no mention on the packaging either. And obviously this situation is made worse by the fact that I've done all of the spacings to my walls based on that 900 millimeter width. So the walls are now wrong as well. So I've got a few options. I can either fit it loose as it is currently. I mean, it would still do the job, but it just looks a bit rubbish, I think. I could simply stretch it and then cut it, but then you lose this finished edging piece. My solution in the end was just to pull the mesh taut and add a few more staples. It didn't look great at the edges, but it'll have to do. And then I can cut away the excess with some wire cutters. I had some old salvaged brass hinges in the workshop. They were really messy, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes cleaning them up a bit. I don't need them to look perfect as they're going to tarnish and weather outside anyway, but I clean them up a bit and get them oiled, and then I can work on recessing them into the edge of my door. This door is really lightweight, so it doesn't really need three hinges, but I'm going to add three anyway, mainly because the timber I'm working with isn't perfectly straight, so I figured it might help to pull the door in tight to the frame and true things up a bit when it comes to fitting. That shiny brass next to the dark grey looks so nice. Shame it's not going to stay shiny for long, really. I can then position the door in the opening and mark up the hinge locations onto the frame so that I can cut the recesses there too. Brass doesn't rust, so these hinges will be fine outdoors, so it saved me some money not having to buy new hinges. I can't delay the inevitable anymore, so it's back to adding more of this awful mesh. And now I knew that my spacings for the mesh were out of whack because I hadn't accounted for how stretchy it was, I decided just to cut away the excess. And to finish the ends, I give the wire a twist and wrap it back around itself. So a bit of an update, after I added the wire to the top section and then trimmed off the edge, I did the bottom section, but this time I actually just stretched the roll out across the width and this measures 1.3 meters. So I was able to stretch that 900 millimeter roll to 1.3, meaning that what I probably should have done originally is put these noggins in the center of the wall rather than spacing them 900 from the top. That way I could have just stretched two lengths of the wire, top and bottom, and everything would have looked neat and even. I will never work with this galvanized mesh ever again. I really regret not investing more money into some of the sheet style mesh. That would have been much easier to fit. I'm also finding these staples really frustrating to work with too, and it doesn't even look nice. So I'm not enjoying this at all. The problem with working with these staples is that you really need three hands. You're trying to stretch and hold the mesh with one hand, you need another to hold the staple, and a third to hammer it in. And they don't always go in straight either. If there's any variation in the grain of the timber, they'll bend one way or the other. They're just very annoying. To keep the walls spaced off the floor, I bought some of these plastic feet, which I can just screw onto the bottom of the walls. In hindsight though, I really should have tried to find some height adjustable feet that are okay for exterior use. It really should have occurred to me at the time that my patio has a gradual slope away from the house. So I'll just have to find another way to deal with that later when it comes to installing the walls. I was so glad to be done with this. Right, so it was time to get the walls assembled. I want to get the first wall roughly positioned and I'm doing this on my own so it's a bit tricky. But I leaned it up against my work platform hoping that it wouldn't fall over and then I can bring in the second wall and the sooner I can get these two walls clamped together, the better. I drill some holes through the timber and into the brick so that I can get a raw plug in and secure it with a screw but I didn't want the wood to be in contact with the wall so I'm going to sandwich in a couple of these spaces behind, which will allow a bit of airflow so that there are no moisture problems with the wall or the timber. Then I can work on getting it sitting level to account for the slope of the paving slabs. 
and I'm going to secure the two walls together with some bolts. And then I can get the other frame fixed to the wall and this time I'm using concrete screws as they're just a bit easier and don't require raw plugs. I then want to shim up the feet that need lifting and to do that I'm just going to roughen up the surface of some of these spare plastic feet and then use some epoxy to glue them onto the bottom of the feet that were screwed in place earlier. It was a happy accident that these happened to be the perfect height although I did have to glue in some washers as additional shims on one or two of the feet just to account for the unevenness of the floor. I can then use my multi-tool to cut away this bottom rail to open up the doorway. Hanging the door went surprisingly well, I just screwed in the hinges. And I can just see how it swings and make sure that my gaps are relatively consistent at the top and the sides. Since cutting away the bottom part of the frame and fitting the door, um, this is a little bit more wobbly than I had anticipated and I'm not really happy with it. So I think what I need is some anchor point into the ground. I was trying to avoid drilling through the paving slabs just so that if we ever want to take this out, then it won't leave any damage, but I really think it's needed in this case. And I've never drilled through a concrete paving slab before, so I'll give it a try. I drilled a six millimeter hole and then tried to drive in a Torx head concrete screw, but it felt a little bit tight and I didn't want to risk cracking the slab. So I drilled it out to eight millimeters and then the screw went in nicely. Then I can get my door hardware fitted. I got a simple gate latch to keep the door closed. And this gate spring, which gets screwed in place to the door and the frame. And then you can tension the spring with this bar and then insert a pin to keep it there. And that tension in the spring means that the door will basically close itself. I'm having second thoughts about how to build the roof. Originally, I was planning to put a batten on the wall and then have joists running across in line with the wall studs. And that's why I did the spacing at 530 millimeters, because then the downpipe would have fitted nicely in between two joists. Then I would have added chicken wire over the top. And you can see that I've already painted all the joists in preparation for fitting them. But right now, the words of Andy at Gosforth Handyman are echoing around in my head. Think maintenance, Keith. Think maintenance. Basically, I realized that building a complete roof in that way was going to make things difficult when the time comes to clear out the gutters a couple of times a year. Now, I do have a couple of other ideas about how to construct a roof that will keep cats inside, but I want to think it through properly. So sorry, I know many of you wanted to see me unleash Mickey into this new space that we've created for him, but that's gonna have to wait until next time. Thanks for watching.